It feels like a good idea in my head. I don't know what it'll feel like. Do you want to put Dorsey at the very first? Start with the second and then do the last one. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course.
morning. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. So that um, is, a, was a, is a quartet by Rossini, the great Italian opera composer. And this is an arrangement of an arrangement. It is originally, string players, correct me if I'm wrong, it's originally a, from a group of six quartets for two violins, cello, and double bass. And then somewhere along the line, in the 19th century, I'm not sure if Rossini himself or somebody else arranged it for string quartet. And then me as a flute player, the biggest compliment I ever can give a piece of music is, is I think that piece would sound good on the flute. <laughs> so we're doing this arrangement for flute instead of it normally would be a first violin. And just to make sure that you were all awake a little bit this morning, we decided to play, start with that second movement which ends, you can probably tell, in a very unsure way, in the halfway. We're supposed to go on. You'll get the resolution in like 45 minutes. Uh, so, we're super happy to be here. We all love Bozeman, we all love Montana. We all have our own individual connections to it. Um, hi, by the way, my name is Emmanuel Davis. I play flute. I'm from Minneapolis. I teach at the University of Minnesota. We'll all go around and introduce ourselves. But I would just figure the first thing I would say is that my, wait, I have an email here from Angela. Just so you know what the direction of the class is today. <laughs> Angela writes, please perform selections from the program. Talk about our creative process. Well, our creative process is stealing other people's music, like we just did. <laughs> Communication chamber music, our careers in music, and maybe a little a brief introduction. Also, you're supposed to, as she says here, come up with questions. So that's your assignment. Um, I just want to say that my connection to, Angela is the first person I met in my uh, freshman year at Juilliard. And so she's the first person I played chamber music with many, many years ago. Uh, and so it's so great that she's here and that we get to come to um, Bozeman and play. This is like my third time here. Um, we're going to play some other selections for you, but before we do, I'm just going to pass around the mic and just let us all introduce ourselves. So here's our violinist, Igor. You guys mind if I just remain seated? See them right now? I think it's, it's pretty informal. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Igor Fikaisen, and I'm delighted to be here. It's my first time in Montana. Uh, I'm originally from Moscow, Russia, and I'm currently living in Denver. I'm a professor of violin at the University of Denver. and. Uh, uh, up here on stage, I've known Alice, our fantastic cellist, the longest we go, we go way back. Uh, and these guys, I feel like I've known them for a long time, but actually we met yesterday. Yes. A lot has transpired since then, a whole life has been lived. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think more on that will come later, but uh, yeah, great to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alice Yu. Um, I actually grew up in Bozeman. I went to Long Hill Elementary, Sacagawea Middle School, and a little bit of Bozeman. And my dad taught five minute walk from here in the computer science department for a very <coughs> long time. So it's such a pleasure to be back. Uh, fun story, your amazing cello professor and I, we were studying with the same cello teacher for many years and I took her lesson with you right before mine. So I really today is good to be able to pass off lessons. Um, I currently live in Denver, Colorado as well. We both work at the same school at the University of Denver. I also teach at Colorado State University and um, I'm so pleased to be back. I was just telling your cello professor, the hall looks exactly the same as when I was a child, except it's a blue, <laughs> it's a different color. So um, pleasure and uh, looking forward to the rest of the hour. Hey, my name is uh, David Hardy and I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. Uh, I studied at Juilliard like these two guys over here at, at a slightly different time, a little bit earlier. And presently, I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Uh, the first time I met Angela was at a festival in uh, Wyoming, in Jackson Hole, and we hit it off, had a lot of fun. And this is my third time here. It's great working with these people, it's wonderful. So as part of the um, creative process and communication, we're now going to discuss amongst ourselves what piece we should play next. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you like? What would, 
What, what should we play? We'll reduce what some Beethoven. Beethoven. Okay, so we're going to play um, two movements of a Beethoven serenade, which is uh, for flute, violin, and viola. It's an early piece of Beethoven's, um, very sweet. It's very classical. It'll remind you of Haydn and early Beethoven. And we're going to play these two movements. Um, the first one is an, an called Entrata, you know, your en an entrance. You'll get that feeling. And then we're going to do um, <coughs> an andante with, with variations. And what's nice about that is that each variation will feature one of us. So it gives us all a little chance to, to shine. Um, and this is only, you should come to the concert on Saturday because this is only a snippet of this really fantastic piece.
どんなはずです Is it working now? Oh, yes. Yeah, right. So, one of the things that Angela said that we should talk about, and maybe I'll just open up this conversation and then you all chime in, is communication and how we communicate with each other. And I'm going to give you my oddball, my oddball thinking about playing in any ensemble, but especially like a chamber ensemble like this. And it comes from a book that I read. About music and music teaching, and in that, the guy, the author quotes Bruce Lee, the amazing martial artist. And Bruce Lee says, Everyone thinks that concentration means that you close off everything around you and you're in your own world. He said, When you're fighting 10 guys at once and they're coming from you in all different, from all different directions of the room, You have to be available and realize everything that's going on behind you and to your sides, and you have to be able to react to that in an instant. And playing chamber music is a little like that, <laughs> in that you have to be available to everything that's going on around you, and you can't be in your own little world. And so we have various ways that we communicate with each other. Sometimes it's verbal, like earlier we were rehearsing this movement. and As a flute player, you, any wind player can understand, we can't talk when we're playing, but string players love to talk in their, as they're playing. <laughs> and so we're, we're rehearsing this movement, and David says to me, this little moment that we're playing together, he's like, I'm playing those notes longer than you are. So I now, it was like a, a verbal communication of him saying, Let's, we're not matching. So there's that kind of a verbal moment where it's like, oh yeah, let's do this, you know. Or there was another time where we're just like, oh, I'm not quite with you there. Can we figure that out? So there's that verbal moment. Then there is just like the nonverbal communication of just what somebody's body language is, in, is, is indicating, like, I'm going to move into this thing. I'm going to show this little moment. I'm going to take a little bit of time there. And then there is the what you do with your sound. Like, there were certain moments that like, I was listening to the other players, and it's like if they make a crescendo into something, We're not talking, but you can tell that they're musically directing into a particular moment that we're going to meet.、Um, and, and the thing about, like, what I like about the Bruce Lee analogy about being ready is that also in chamber music in this piece, which we, well, actually, Igor's, Igor has never played this piece before, and he's playing it really, like, he had his first rehearsal with us yesterday, but you would never know.、Uh, we have played this piece many, many times. Um, but what's amazing is that even in that short amount of time, in, in one of our little, in the opening movement of this, without any discussion, I was admiring how at one moment David, in his part, decided to take a, a little chance. And he just took a little bit of extra time. But we were there like, oh yeah, he can do that. It's fine. But we didn't sort of discuss it. And if he'll ever do it again, I have no idea. But anyway, so that's just like a little bit of an idea about some of our communication. And maybe if you guys have anything you might want to chime in, Alex, or Julia, you're nodding. So. Oh, oh, I just agree with everything、uh, you are saying. If I had to add, as you guys are all music students here and、um, learning through your own preparation,、um, I would add that in order to find freedom, You have to be super, super, super prepared. The more prepared you are, it gives you more freedom.、Um, so, the sort of ability that chamber your music muscle to be able to listen out and respond to what、uh, your partners are doing requires a lot of homework. So, for me personally, my goal before I sit down with everyone is to be able to just sit down and play. So, I have to be very comfortable with my own parts. I practice my own part. Do a lot of score study so that I'm really aware of what everyone individually is doing so that, like, if there are things going off script, so to speak,、um, and as we sit down and get to know one another, which is what the rehearsal is for,、uh, I, I feel like I'm very flexible and have elephant ears, like vacuum cleaner ears, where I can hear everything and feel really,、uh, like, gumby, malleable things, what others are doing. And, and I feel like that、um, there's no magic wand, it just comes from practice. And being really, really prepared. I always tell my students、um, don't be that person who stops and being like, So, where are we? <laughs> so, like, you're like, you want to be the person that's like, Oh, I know where we are. I know your part. <laughs> so,、um, 
That would be my thoughts about um, how to have the most fulfilling chambers experiences when you sit down with uh, again, people you just, I've known him forever, <laughs> played a lot. But again, there's always fresh and new every time you play. But people you just meet at the very beginning of the week. So it comes with a lot of hard work and preparation and then suddenly you can just have a lot of fun. Those are great comments. I don't have much to add to that, but uh, I remember my uh, teacher at Juilliard, whose father played in one of the greatest string quartets of the early part of the 20th century. He always, uh, his father would always, he was a viola player in the Bush Quartet, and he always said that uh, you must listen to your colleagues almost more than yourself. And so you have, you sort of, you're lit, there's a foreground and a background sort of what you were sort of talking about. Uh, and also, to me, chamber music is, uh, it's conversation. And it's having a discussion, it's just like he was talking about, I might have thrown a little curve or whatever, but you know, everybody's throwing little things here and there, and we're very comfortable playing together. And, uh, but it really is, a, it really is about a, a truly a conversation rather than just trying to be together. Obviously, we're trying to line things up, but uh, that's what makes it fun and creative. And also, because, as, as Alice was saying, because we're prepared, or as prepared as we best could be, um, we can be spontaneous, and we can sort of try to make it, I, I like to think of like trying to make this an improvised event as well, not something that's just on paper. So that's my two cents. Do you want to play something? Should we play something? Would we like to hear like, oh, I was thinking that, that people would like a break from the flute and maybe oh. they'd like to hear like a violin and cello duo or a viola. <laughs> Speaking of throwing up curves. <laughs> yeah, sure.
just the, yeah. Wait, I'm a slow learner. <laughs> You'll get it <laughs> by or the not. time it's over. <laughs> Every every instrument has a certain personality that's drawn to the I don't say it's working. I think it's not me. Oh, yeah, there's three. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the battery is gone. <laughs> sure. sure. <laughs> what about now? No. Yeah. I think if you speak loudly in the hall, we'll be we'll fine. fine. Okay. What about the but the It'll live stream? Oh, you got us. We're okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. The <laughs> mic has been fired. Okay. I, I will just project. If you guys can hear us, well, uh, you will survive, but please do let us know. Uh, yeah, you want to talk about instruments a little sure. bit? Sure. Yeah. By the way, what instruments do we have out in the hall? I mean, everything, everything right? Right here, you all drink, drink wind, brass, brass piano. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> or mix. Do the good mix. Great. Well, uh, I will start. As, Violinists, we can spend hours talking about our instruments, our bows, our cases. Uh, but you know, there's a there's a famous saying by Nathan Milstein that we don't actually play the violin; the violin plays us. Because of course, the lifetime of a violin is uh, almost eternal, and uh, well, versus our lives are uh, unfortunately limited uh, in time. Anyways, uh, I'm very fortunate to be playing a uh, violin from the great Cremonese maker Lorenzo Storioni which mm -hmm. was made in 1770. Um, so right now it's passing through me and after me it will probably be played by uh, someone else. Uh, but uh, it's a violin that's been in my family for a very, very long time and one that I'm very attached to. It. And uh, uh, it can be tempestuous, especially in different weather and altitude, but uh, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything else. So. Oh, um, I'll, I'll move closer so you can hear me. Um, my cello is compared to Igor the baby cello. So there's a wonderful maker named Ryan Soltis. Um, and uh, it's kind of cool. I commissioned him to make me a cello. So we sat down and I kind of, he heard videos of my old cello, which is a, a Noni Italian instrument, really beautiful. But if you sneeze, it would sound different. It was very temperamental, but I still love it. And it, it served me well through all my college days. And then, I decided as I'm getting older, and some of you might be feeling this, as, uh, or maybe not quite yet, hopefully, but I realize there's uh, an easier way. <laughs> uh, this cello, it's, it makes, it's so easy to play. It has a lot of character, it's wonderful, and it's very cool. The, the, when you think about the history of how old uh, Igor's instrument is, and the hands that might have gone through it, and all the different vibrations that went through from each player molding this instrument, uh, but what's really cool is I'm the only one that's heard this film uh, since 2018. So like only the vibrations I've made that has been sort of molding this baby cello and it's been sort of changing over the years to how I play. So it's kind of cool and I can solely say it's mine. And uh, he's, uh, the maker used to live in rural Idaho and then he said it got too crazy for him, too busy. So he's now in the middle of the woods somewhere in Canada. Uh, we message occasionally. <laughs> He says he photos of the making of, of like of like elk sausage <laughs> and very amount of meat and cheese will be here as well. And I'm like, I thought you were doing work. And my instrument was also made in the 1700s. It was made by a Venetian maker or just outside of Venice uh, by a guy named Pietro Antonio della Costa. And it's a very it's a very unusual and rare instrument and. The back of the instrument is a wood that most people never use. It's made out of cherry. And there was, I guess in his town, there was cherry wood since Roman times. And it was the cherry picking capital of Northern Italy. And it belonged to a guy in the Toronto Symphony. And it sat under a bed after he passed away for about eight years. And I got a phone call in the middle of the night from the principal base of the symphony, uh, telling me that I had to go to Philadelphia and pick this viola up. So I went to Philly and was lucky enough to be able to get it, purchase it, and it's been, it's been my partner for 40 years. So it's like what he was saying, they're moody and sometimes the weather that we're dealing with up here is we're coming up to 5,000 feet, it's, 
<laughs> the personality of, I mean, the essence is the same, but it certainly feels different than it does when it's in a different climate. Same for flutes. So, um, I, my flutes are kind of cool, but they're not as, um, we don't have any flutes from the 1760s, 1770s of Italy. But this flute um, is uh, by a, a famous maker, American maker, Vern Powell, Vern Q. Powell, and this is a flute from his early workshop. He started, Vern Q. Powell was a jeweler from Kansas, and then he started making flutes, and he worked for another famous flute player, uh, flute maker in Boston, Haynes, William Haynes. And uh, in 1927, Powell went on, on, on his own, and um, was making flutes, and this is a flute that he made in 1936. Uh, and I like kind of older flutes. I mean, new flutes are awesome too, but I just kind of like this vintage of flutes because um, the players that I grew up listening to when I was a kid, they all kind of played flutes like this, and so it was the instrument that I had in my ear. And this flute was made for an, a, uh, a, an amateur flute player in 1936 and the nice thing about that is that it didn't get played a lot so like sometimes you buy old flutes and like they've been played by lots of players which means like they've been banged against music stands or they have scratches and this flute spent most of its life um, in a safe so it's not so all the scratches are from me <laughs> uh, so there are no other scratches on it but the one of the reasons I bought this flute um, is that so this flute's number is a pal number 245 from 1936 he you know, put a little number on all of his flutes. And the one of the reasons I bought this flute was that my sainted teacher was this guy named Julius Baker, who was this wonderful, he's been gone for 20 years now. But he was this wonderful flute player, uh, played in the New York Philharmonic and Chicago Symphony. And he had his flute that he got out of school, was Powell number 299. So just like a couple of years after this one. And he played that flute for like the first 30 years of his career. And it was the only flute he ever played and it was <coughs> stolen in like 1959, and it never turned up. And after that, like these guys are saying, like their instruments are like, it's, it's part of your, you know, it's like your baby. And he went and he played like millions of different flutes after that, but the first 25 years or so of his career, it was the only flute he played. And when I found this flute, I brought it to a lesson with Julius Baker, and he played it and he said, this flute is the closest flute I've ever played to mine that was stolen, so I bought it. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the little spiel with my flute. Um, hey, we're going to play two more things for you, and we're supposed to end at noon. 11 to 11.50. 11.50. We have seven minutes. Questions. Questions. Yeah. Is there a question out there? Somebody, please ask us something. <laughs> Don't be shy. You can... Come on. Somebody. Really? It's covered over here. <laughs> wow. Oh, thank oh you. My oh, wait. Oh, now, so now I can see. see. Okay, cool. Nope. Uh, I mean, questions. Oh, wait, we have a question in the front. I'm just curious because there's been some um, change in voices in the ensemble. What the repertoire, um, like how you decide, kind of, how you put your program together on short notice with people that not all of you have worked Um, the Angela, I mean, Angela, David, and I were the sort of original people that were going to play. And so Angela and I started talking. She wanted to do a flute and strings program. And, um, and I said, oh, well, Angela, we have to do the Beethoven flute serenade. And she said, oh, that's perfect because it's Renee's favorite piece in the world. <laughs> so I was like, okay, no pressure. <laughs> so the Beethoven serenade got picked that way. And then she said, what else is cool? And I said, well, there's this awesome duet by Vila Lobos, the Brazilian composer for flute and cello. We're about to play you a movement of. And Angela said, oh, we got to do that. And then um, we wanted to do something with everybody. And I said, well, we can't do Beethoven and Mozart in the same program. It's because like, they're too close. So we found this Rossini thing. And then how'd you guys decide the string pieces? Did she just tell you? Angela told us. Yeah. Angela just she told everyone them. what to do. She found them. Yeah. Um, That's five minutes. Okay, you want to do like a minute? Or should we do a little bit of Lobos or should we just? We'll just do this. All right, we're going to give you a quick snippet of this. Uh, it's called the Jet Whistle. 
Uh, it's kind of, it feels like a little bit like a train ride by Vila Lobos. This is the first movement. Thank you all very much, by the way. This has been fun. Really, no questions? Last chance. <laughs> Speak now. Oh, wait, there you yes. go. Go. So, as a, as a group, um, are there any other, I'm sure there's sometimes disagreements that come up. I don't know if, like, how do you handle that when there's, like, mutual disagreements or disagreements about the report, for example? Uh, Good question. Good question. Thankfully, we haven't had any in the 48 hours that we've been together. <laughs> but there's still three more days. <laughs> we got time. Uh, it helps a lot. A lot of wine. <laughs> uh, you know, you just discuss it. I mean, it, it, it's not that big a deal. You know, it's like, yes, you can. You, you, you just try things out. It's like somebody will say, I want to slow down there. And it's like, OK, I don't know if it works, but let's try it. And then it's like, you do it. And it's like, sometimes it works. Sometimes you can convince somebody. But um, it's not too bad. I, mean, I, I think in given the situation here, since we're doing things in a very short span of time, it's pretty easy just to, we're so flexible, we just sort of go with whatever ideas happen. But uh, I can tell you, I've played in three professional string quartets, and it can get very personal, and it can get very intense, and uh, sometimes out of hand. But, um, I try to avoid those situations <laughs> altogether, but generally speaking, I think just what he said, it's, it's reflexible and it's, it's not a big deal if something's a little bit different. Sometimes it's a great, it's fresh. But I would also add, as you like, uh, are starting your professional careers and you'll be in a lot of professional situations where it, it, it's sort of, you're cultivating your professional relationships right now. Like your college career is not just college, it's uh, the beginning of your professional life. So you learn how to communicate with each other and, and develop professional relationships with each other. Even if you're playing with your best friend in the whole world, mm -hmm. uh, you learn to discuss things differently. So for example, one of my best friends is a violinist. We've played together for 20 years. Um, somebody was very surprised because they thought we had just met because we have a different relationship outside of what we play and what, what we text and talk about <laughs> personally. And another advice, um, uh, a, a stand-up comedian <laughs> shared this, that when they're doing improv, it's not no but, but yes and. Mm -hmm. So uh, whatever situation, and like, not everything you're gonna wanna do is always the best idea. So then when you have like a lot of humility and like an open mind, um, and every idea is a good idea, so you have to try it, like uh, Emmanuel said, and, and the response should be yes and. Right? Um, not, yeah, no, but, no, which is the easiest first uh, response for a lot of people. 
So that's my uh, uh, maybe uh, something to try in the future. We're going to resolve quickly that unresolved chord from the beginning with the last movement of this Rossini quartet to send you out whistling to your class. <laughs> Thank you all very much.